Welcome back, everybody, to Fear of a Flat Planet. My name is Henry Jackson, and joining me today, we have Mr. John Leslie. John, how are you? I'm great, thanks. How are you doing? I'm very well, sir. Um, now, the purpose of this podcast serves a few different things. First co- uh, first sort of uh, business item on the list is to introduce you to the Fear of the Flat Planet crew, because you're actually going to be doing some interviews later on, I believe, um, taking over the Paralympic team part. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a fun experience for me. I, I've uh, been on the receiving end of interviews of podcasts, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to be on the host side. So uh, hopefully you guys are, enjoy a ginger monarchy. <laughs> Now, John, what have you been up to today? I, he- I hear you were, you were off on some crazy pass somewhere. Were you on the Duffy Pass? Is that right? Well, yeah, that's the that that was the plan, but uh, unfortunately, life has its way of doing things. But um, yeah, the the weather just like opened up awesome for the next two days. Um, so the original plan was to go up into the Duffy and do some camping and split boarding, but uh, I think we're just going to have to pivot on that one. But that's life. We all know about pivoting, especially yeah. during these times. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that's it's kind of a, a stepping stone for a bigger project that I got going on this year, which is I'd like to do the Spearhead Traverse in, in Whistler, which I'm sure you've heard about. It's a very, uh, I don't know, it, it's like, it's a very well-known traverse. Yeah, and, I've uh, seen your postings on, on Insta talking about it. So what, what, um, yeah. what preparations? I mean, to get up the Duffy, number one, and let's use this as a nice segue. You've got to have a decent vehicle to get up there. And of course, Toyota has joined the uh, Canada snowboard team uh, yep. recently. So what are you, what are you rocking when you, when you head up the pass? Yeah, I've got a Tacoma actually. I've got a 2000. I'm pretty stoked on it. I was like, you know, that generation of Tacoma is kind of sought after. And uh, she's actually in the shop right now getting a, a two inch lift kit. It feels like the truck, it feels like the truck and, and vehicles like this is so ingrained in the kind of Canadian snowball thing. Cause in, in Europe, we, you know, we don't have sleds. We don't necessarily mm. like four by four is great, but we're not heading out like the massive Canadian road trips or like, you know, a big road trip for us is for me, I'm in Austria, I head to Lux. It's like a four hour drive. I mean, for you guys, that seems like you just going down the shop to get some milk. Yeah, I think so. And, and you know, so many, uh, like, I guess uh, for our situation in Canada, so many of us grow up in like small towns, you know, elsewhere in Canada and you grow up with like these certain habits and then you, 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 you know, you dream of living in the mountain town with your snowmobile and your four by four. And, you know, that's, that's just all what we're trying to do out here, I guess. It's been so interesting talking to other members of the Canadian snowboard team as well, because in my mind, you know, you know, obviously you've got the hubs of Whistler and, and around Calgary and that, but there's so many members of the team who actually grew up nowhere near the, the good mountains. I mean, not to say that the little hills that they grew up on weren't good, but like it seems to be a common theme that people live a long way away from where the real snowboard scene is in Canada. It's pretty cool how many people like decide to make the move um, out to BC or wherever to like chase the snow and it really, man, to me, I'm always reminded of how lucky I am to like live in Canada and to have that option. When did your pilgrimage to the West Coast start? And what was it, the classic like buddies jumping in together and the Tacoma uh, heading west? No. Or? no, I wish, but it was it was its own cool story for sure. Like um, I was kind of all geared up to be like, I was just finishing up high school and I was gearing up to go into college. So this was around May and um I got an invite to try out for the Canadian Paralympic snowboard team. Cause at this point, like I hadn't even heard of disabled snowboarding or knew that there was like a world cup circuit. This is in 2011. And um, yeah, so I got an invite to like try out for the team and, you know, a strategic way to do that as a team captain or as a coach is like the summertime you have the glacier, you know, you can go mountain biking and then you can do stuff in the gym. That's a really good way to see how an athlete, you know, is if they're trainable, like if, if this is going to work out. <laughs> um, so yeah, I got on a flight in May and I came out to Whistler and I just, I got to do exactly what I described to you. A kid in Ontario flew out and within, you know, six hours, I was able to snowboard, mountain bike, best skate park. You know, if you really wanted to, you could jump in the lake. 
there was no way I was leaving. So like, I wasn't like stereotypical come out for the winter. Like I came out in the shoulder season, got to experience a little bit of everything. And I was like, if it's this good now, like I can't imagine how good it is in the winter. Yeah. I, uh, it just, it suited me so well as a, as a human being, um, this lifestyle, this environment. And then too, also like credit to, you know, the Canadian sports system, you know, they took, so this is 2011. So this is right after the 2010 Olympics, which was in Vancouver, Whistler. And, um, they had housing and a gym and all these facilities set up that like also lured me. And it's like, I can have the best on snow training and like skateboarding stuff, but then also be able to recover and do those other necessary parts of being an, uh, being an athlete while keeping all my costs at like the absolute cheapest. And that's of course, one of the benefits of being part of uh, Canada snowboard. Uh, again, I've been speaking to some of the other athletes and, and riders and, you know, a lot of them had had their own come up, you know, like the Seb Toots and the Martin Morrises, they'd had their kind of like, they'd, let's say they definitely made it before Canada Snowball kind of evolved to what it is now. But like mm. the, the common theme throughout everyone from the sort of the rookies coming up to them now as well is like just the support that you guys received. It's pretty rad. Like that they, I mean, yeah. Mark was saying, you know, he's got a pretty winning formula, but also there's a great pressure taken off because anything that they can do to make it easier like as much or as little as you need, it's just there when you need it. So did you feel yeah. that from the beginning? Was that like, boom, oh. straight, out, straight in? I was so lucky. I got to meet Dustin Heiss. That was my first like experience with Canada Snowboard. If you know him, he's just a total gem. He's now the CEO or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, when you understand the beast, it makes things a lot easy. You know, you can sleep better at night, so to speak. And yeah it's it's they've always been progressive it's always been you know a work there's a lot more play than kind of meets the eye you know someone wouldn't really know like Dustin is the CEO so there's a board above him making you know the decisions that goes to Dustin and then it's Dustin's job as a CEO of a company to then do that from a company a business perspective um and you know it's taken some time to have the board and the business align and I'd say that kind of happened like five years ago and so like the support that we were already feeling is now finally had some time to snowball effect. And it's like, just like, it's such a cool thing to be a part of where it's just like, everything is hitting off well. And uh, I think you can tell by like the success we have on the snow, off the snow, and like with athletes actually feeling this love and support. Even within the, the greater snowball community, you've got your own Canada snowball sort of community yeah. supporting you wherever, wherever they can. Anything that they help us with in sport is, you know, it applies to life. And I think that's where we have a really good alignment now with, with like everything is, you know, um, we are here to do a job. We are here to perform and be snowboarders, but you know, there's also a full person that you have to keep in mind of and, and support them and, and grow them. Epic. Now, we, we, we may have got slightly ahead of ourselves as far as, um, I'm obviously familiar with your story, but for anyone tuning in, like we've mm -hmm. we obviously dropped the word Paralympics a couple of times. And for those tuning in, they may not know your, your background and where, where you've, you know, where you've come from to get to this stage and, you know, your sort of uh, life journey as it were. So do you want to take us a little bit through what you've been through? Cause it's, sure, sure. I have to say like the first time I read the story, I was like, wow, this is uh, <laughs> going to be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's cool. Like I, um, so when I was, 10 years old I was playing a ton of hockey like we, we talked about I grew up in a small town in Ontario and uh, you know developed a bump on my knee my knee got really sore uh, and luckily the, my doctor caught it early and it, we, it was it, I was diagnosed with bone cancer the big term is called osteogenic sarcoma uh, so I was basically I was given three surgery options um, um, two of them being amputations and one of them being a fake bone that would go in there. And so at this point, sport had already affected my life enough that I was like, okay, I, the fake bone wasn't going to be strong enough to take the impacts of skateboarding, mountain biking, hockey, whatever. So that was kind of off the table. So I was kind of left with two other surgery options and I went with this more unique one. And again, the reason is because it allowed the most access to sport. So what they do is they cut you above your knee and remove it. And then they take the your, whole joint, the whole joint's gone. Yeah. And then they take your foot and they basically like your foot on that same leg yeah. and they reattach it 
where your knee used to be. So your heel ends up being like your kneecap and then going down to your toes is kind of like your calf. And now the reason for that is like when it's hooked. So you've got your like normal um, quad here and then it's attached to your foot. And then these are your toes. And what ends up happening is you have this knee joint that you can move with your brain. And so when I'm set up with my prosthetic, it kind of looks like a big knee brace that is attached to a prosthetic. And now I can move that joint with my foot. Very long way of saying it was going to allow me to play the most amount of sports um, as close to normal as possible. Yeah. Um, so, so you you alluded to that. So it's, you were already you were already into sports. You were a full you know yeah. competitive do everything, hockey, yeah. mountain bike, and skate bike, uh, skateboarding, every, absolutely everything. Had you tried snowboarding before? Uh, no, I was skiing at that point. So my my mom and dad are big oh, skiers. No. I know, I know. I was ski racing too, which is even worse. But uh, yeah, so so yeah, so diagnosed with cancer. Uh, started chemotherapy six months into that they chopped off my leg did another six months of chemo just to make sure there's no more cancer floating around and then spit out the other end once chemo was done like my energy started to come back exponentially like that that was like the catalyst like getting rid of that so and this this is at the age of 10 years old so 12 months of chemo and an amputation yeah so spit out at 11 got one leg you know but, but again, like, uh, I had such a supportive, you know, community, friend group and family. And so, you know, it really wasn't me. Like I'm a product of my surroundings and I, I just hit the jackpot pot on terms of like the support that I received. So it was, it did suck. Don't get me wrong. Cancer treatment sucks. Losing your life sucks, but you spit out the other end. And I was just like, it's one of those opportunities where it's like what I sort of pronounce to the world. Like if I had the attitude of like, this sucks. Oh, woe is me. That's what I received. And if I was like positive and let's try new things, that's what I got. So it was like, jump back into sport, you know, lots of support kind of got back into hockey, but I could, I wasn't being that I wasn't able to get to that same competitive level. And at the same time, I'm also getting older. Right. So by the time I'm like 15, I'm just kind of getting the hot hand at one legged hockey, 15 year my friends are freaking good you know what i mean like you can tell you want to be showing up and destroying folk yeah exactly you want to be the first of the puck like every once in a while and i was just (laughs) like yeah and uh, anyway so but again like it wasn't something that i was always me about i was like okay let's find something that i can be competitive in and like maybe hides my prosthetic a little bit more and so snowboarding it was like you, you know, like, uh, like I said, I was ski racing before. So after I lost my leg, I got back into snowboarding because it made more sense to have both legs on one thing. Yeah. Cause like ski racing, I was thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have yeah, like yeah. a short wheel well, yeah. to fly off. Like, so, um, yeah, got into snowboarding. There was a high school team at the time. Uh, it was a great thing to do with my friends. I'm like, man, it was cool. It was like super fun. Um, so got into, um, snowboard racing in high school was more of an excuse just to get out of class and then <laughs> the classic yeah and then just kind of through the grapevine like um cassandra smith um who did a lot of work out and i think alberta and bc in her early days had just made the move out to ontario to try and push some more snowboarding um in ontario she got wind of me through the pipeline and anyway that's how in 2011 basically Canada snowboard and the, the, the disabled part of the squad, the para team found out about me, this one-legged kid in Ontario racing in high school races and doing half decent. And so, yeah, that that's when I, I actually competed in a world cup in that April just to see like what it was going to be like. And I, I did pretty good. I did like fifth in the world. So then they were like, okay, yeah, you should come out to Whistler and like give this a go. Two Olympic games in the bag now. Yep. Yep. Two. Um, been to X games twice, been to like do two or three times, like, you know, opportunities to film with people and meet people and live with people that like, I only thought would ever be a dream. And yeah. How have you found the, the sort of worldwide snowball community as accepting towards the Paralympic athletes? And have you, have you ever found any sort of, Oh yeah. Or like, has it always just been come on in and shred? Oh yeah. Like I, I think that the, the snowboard community, 
my personal opinion is like the underlying thing is you're right. We always have been like a rebel. We've always sort of like gone against the grain, so to speak. And within that, like we've built a community, right? And that doesn't, that doesn't label your gender, your color, your nation, nothing, right? Like it's just this rebel community, right? And so we've always stuck together. Um, so like in 2011, um, those couple of years, the push leading up to the games, I wasn't, I didn't like, I was competing against people from other countries, but we weren't holding stuff back. We all wanted to see each other excel, get sponsors, push the sport, make it to the games, do a good debut. Cause we love snowboarding and we wanted like the world to love snowboarding as much as we do, you know? So when I think about disabled snowboarding and, you know, regular snowboarding, whether it's, whether it's snowboard racing, border cross or Alpine or whatever, I feel like there's just, when you get the right people, there are there's so much acceptance because they, they see a sport that they love and they just found out something really cool about it. They're like, whoa. What does the future hold for you as far as um, are you, do you have eyes set on any more competitive goals or is your focus shift more onto these uh, let's say sort of self-competitive goals with the, with the, with the traverse that you're planning and like split boarding goals or have you still got a, is Beijing floating around? Somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like it's, I think it was like a two part, you know, this is just me personally, like it was kind of a two part thing. Um, coming out of 2018 was a lot more challenging on me than I was a expecting or B let myself to believe was that I was actually going through um, like a burnout. Um, so there was that kind of going on for the last few since 2018. And then when COVID happened, that's when I like just getting a break from everything. I was like, Oh shit. Like, like I realized what had happened over the last, anyway, I'm getting like, you're not my therapist, but uh, <laughs> it was, it, I've had to do some like reprioritizing and some rearranging like for myself personally. And COVID was a blessing in that sort of way where I was able to realize that was, there was change that needed to happen. Um, but also too, it took a lot of the stress of competing off. Like in November, when that second wave hit, I made the personal decision and talked to Greg, my coach. And I said, like, I'm not doing anything for the next eight months. For me personally, I, I needed some more time to focus on myself. And with this kind of pause, it was this perfect opportunity to do so. It's been interesting chatting to a lot of the other athletes on the team. Like, you know, listen to like, I... It's just the longest I've ever been off my snowboard in my whole life. And you talk to guys like Seb and he was just like, yeah, I've, you know, I've not been on my board. And I was for the first couple of months starting to freak out. And then I, I think a sort of similar sentiment to you. He's like, actually, do you know what? I ne when do I ever get to do this? Normally I'm on a plane, long distance plane. I'm jet lagged. I've got this house. I've got this opportunity to sort of, sort of comp uh, decompress and get more sight for the next or the, whenever the first event is. Just so yeah. that, so you like on the technological side of your of your prosthetic. So how many do you have a different size, like like add on for each sport that you do? Like yeah. do you have a quiver? Do you have a quiver of legs? I did have a quiver when I was a kid, a little punk kid wanting to try everything. <laughs> uh, as you get older, you realize that like that actually goes through insurance. And if it's just sitting there not being right. used, right. like, so at the current moment, I have a small quiver of, uh, of three. So I have a walking leg. Yeah. Um, and I've got my snowboard leg, which I can grab actually. It'll take two seconds. Do it. Snowboard leg. So this one's just like we were saying, it's quite a bit shorter on yeah. the stem here um which makes sense if you compare it to like wearing stilts like when you're snowboarding you yeah. want to get lower and you can't lower like you can't anyway it's just easier to shorten it yeah um and then that little black ball is like a shock absorber yeah and then it's also like a torsion so it gives me a little bit of like side to side movement which is really nice for like because when you're initiating any sort of turn right you kind of push your knees out and yeah. you, it's kind of nice to have a little bit of a flex in that bottom part of the leg instead of it just immediately. Yeah. Anyway. And then I, uh, I also have one of those blades, um, for, uh, I don't really necessarily use it for running cause running is 
it's pretty hard on like on a residual limb, yeah. um, but like for sprints uh, at the gym or like uh, quick feet work. Um, sometimes if I'm feeling fancy, I'll use it for like box jumps. Um, and so yeah, so it, it just gives me that little extra step in the gym. So you got full range of mobility within the quiver. Have you? Yeah, uh, yeah I've been a little bit strategic with uh, how I've adapt, uh, how I've gotten it. And then also, the snowboard leg also doubles as the surf leg, but the ocean water just crushes it. So that means that I play a prosthetist for the weekend and I'm constantly having to change the bolts and like, uh, yeah, yeah. I can imagine that that salt water getting in there. So I think, I mean, as far as I can say at the moment, I think we're, we're doing pretty well. And I know you've got a very busy day ahead of you. you you're kind enough to make time for us at this yeah. point. It's, it's all good. Like I said, it was uh, like between you and I, like I had a bunch of things on my plate this week. And like one of them was to get this lift kit in my truck because yeah. the wheels aren't aligned. And before I do a wheel, like I'm planning on doing this anyway. So to do a wheel alignment, I should just get the lift at the same time and then get everything aligned. This is a dream scenario then. So the truck's been lifted. The wheels are aligned. Yeah. You're heading up for, let's go, let's, let's take three different scenarios. You're heading for a day of training. Okay, loading up the Tacoma, it's it's a day of practice before, let's say, the world champs. Yeah. Who do you take in the truck? What are you taking the truck? Ooh. What's the morning preparations? Where's your pit? So our last yeah. camp in uh, in Sunshine. So yeah. the the squad in the truck was myself uh, and my dog Zach. We normally listen to uh, really bad rap. And uh, we were in Banff. Sorry, I should have given you some perspective. We're in Banff. And so from Banff to Sunshine is about like a 20 minute drive. Uh, it's a beautiful drive. Like the Rockies are stunning. Whip out to the ski hill and same sort of thing that we talked about. Like out there, we saw everything. So like I just kept it in four wheel drive. And uh, yeah, yeah, just you know, got from A to B. And is that your pretty standard setup? Zach, Zach's always in the truck. Zach is always in the truck. Yeah. And what's funny about Zach is he always, oh my gosh, he looks kind of like a medium sized dog, you would think, but yeah. the kid takes up the most amount of room, <laughs> like he requires the entire back of the truck. It's ridiculous. And if you, uh, does, is Zach going to come on your split board mission with you? Uh, no, he, uh, he's been on a few missions, a few cabin trip missions for yeah. sure, but uh, he's normally a pretty big distraction and, uh, I, I need, I would like to be focused for this yeah. one. So, but that's he, man, he lives a great life. Um, yeah. He'll end up spending four days with probably some array of good looking women that want to take care of him. <laughs> that's okay. That's not, not, not too bad of a life for old Zach. And one thing I did want to ask you um, was it's, so it's, there's, there's obviously, um, there's a certain amount of curiosity that comes with, with seeing someone with one leg or, or missing both legs, or let's say an amputee a athlete uh, shredding or snowboarding. And is there a way that people should approach you if they do have questions? Is it something that you, you know, oh, yeah. I annoys you? Or does it does it piss you off? Like, do you have yeah, people going like, look at that guy? What's he doing? Like, a little bit about your experience with that, and and what should people do, or how could people approach if they are curious about this? Because it is, it's not only is it fascinating, but it's, it's so impressive what a lot of the guys I know from, from that scene are able to achieve. And yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's definitely something uh, that I always, always encourage. Um, and like, I have, you know, there's two sides to this of like, you know, when I talk to amputees about this, like, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of amputees that do not want to be bothered. Don't yeah. want to be asked questions. Don't want people pointing or anything. Um, anyway, but my, my personal opinion on it is like, for a lot of these people, we're the first person with a disability they've ever, um, spoken to. So yeah. you think about it like that, like, this is an opportunity for me to leave this person with a lasting impression of what someone with a disability is like. So if you like get mad at them or shrug them off, you're going to create, especially in a kid, this non-talkable subject. And it's going to put it on a pedestal when it, it's totally a talkable subject. It's reality, man. Like, like anyone could go get hit. Like, it's like, you know what I mean? Like there's some sort of, there's got to be some sort of number out there by one and how many every, every people has a disability. Right. Um, 
so yeah, so it's always, so like with kids, it's always an opportunity. No question is stupid. Pointing is encouraged, like bring it all, like let it all out with me because I will take it, accept it. And then the next one won't be so bad. You, you know what I mean? Like the kid will, the kid might not even be asked. They might even just say like, oh, there's another person with one leg because they had like a positive experience that it won't come across as so crazy. Um, with people, with older people, adults, uh, and like anything like that, it's, it's, I always take it completely as like, they're fascinated. I have no idea how this works. They don't get it. It's cool. Yeah. And they just want to know. And like at our age to have the, the humility, I guess, to be able to ask someone straight, like when someone my age comes up to me and goes, Hey man, like what happened to your leg? Like I could never do that. So I always think like, man, you got some guts. You must yeah. be like really interested in this. And it's the same sort of thing. I take it as an opportunity to, to educate, to learn, to bond, to take off what having a disability, like taking disability off a pedestal. Cause like the reality is, is like, I still pay like truck insurance, you know, I still got to you know, put, get like pay rent, like work a job. Like there's no magical little break because I have one leg, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? And so I think if it's a, if it's just an open subject, um, it's really good. I'd say like the one misconception that I've run into a lot is when you see someone shredding, uh, whether it's in a, a wheelchair, or if they're missing an arm or if they're missing a leg and they're shredding like at a very high level, cause I got this a bunch but sometimes on like a day where it's really busy, especially in Whistler and parking's like really far away, I'll use the handicap parking spot. And so that's tricky because when I'm wearing snow pants, it just looks like some like punk ass snowboarder just like took this spot. <laughs> yeah. So, there, so the misconception is that like always if you see someone parking, if you think someone is doing something wrong with a disability, it's way better to assume they have a disability and be wrong about that than to assume they don't have a disability and have that smashed in your face. What's a, like just a general, like non-training day on the mountain for you? Obviously I know what you're going to say. If there's, if there's three foot of fresh air, we don't even have to answer that. Like, yeah, I think that's a no brainer for anyone, but do you go, do you go ahead, head down the park or are you just more cruising on the groomers? What's your, what's your such <laughs> attack on a cruise day? little bit of everything like we said like constantly got like some sort of progression on my mind so there, there'd probably be some sort of theme or something i'd be working on so if it was like jumping i'd obviously be in the park a little bit more if it was turning probably like more early morning like getting on the harder pack rumors but i'd say like a stereotypical day a good warm-up i find it just therapeutic meditative i like i normally have a coffee so it's just like you know as you're kind of making your way up the hill you're doing some like light stretching some activations my first two runs are normally on like something green i'll do like a switch run and then from that point like that's when normally i'll be like have pick something like i'll hit a side hit and be like oh i suck at jumping today like time to go jump for the next like three hours do you think what happened to you through fuel on that fire or do you think had you not been through this whole sort of life changing changing event you would still be you know this driven person that you are today i mean it's a difficult question obviously because it happened to you when you were so no, no, no. i think it gave me more uh like it definitely made me feel unique i didn't feel special but i just like the reality was I never thought in a million years that like i'd be able to pursue like professional snowboarding and then like losing my leg like no way what I thought that would have been a thing and then when it was a thing I was like yeah like <laughs> gonna do this maybe you know a thin line between friend and enemy when it comes to competition day how does that go and how has the vibe amongst the uh, Paralympic teams yeah yeah no there's there is you know there's probably some sort some small rivalries um but yeah no, we're all, we're all pretty stoked. Like at the end of the day, when like we're riding at such a high caliber for one legged kids, it always blows me away. So like whatever someone has to do to win, they've done, they pulled something out of their ass and you just like, ah, <laughs> oh, you beat me again, but yeah, you know what? You kind of deserved it from whatever you did. Like, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, man, we've, we, we've have such a good community. Like I've got, yeah, great friends in the States, uh, like Finland, Italy. Yeah. All, all over the place. Australia. Very good. Well, um, John, I think to be honest, we've, I mean, I personally, we could sit here 
and chat for i feel like we could chat for hours and hours but the yeah. podcast does at some point need to we do need to wrap it up i yeah, will yeah, i will good. say at this point we'd like to say a huge shout out to our sponsors of course skull candy as we're both rocking here um then we've got red bull as well but also anyone out there who wants to get involved and support canada snowboarding can go on the website and donate money directly if you want to your regional team so you know if you're from ontario you can donate to your local team there or you can donate to the uh to the main team but if you would rather go and buy some merch because there's some pretty sick canada snowball merch out there um mine's still lost in the post i'm still waiting for it uh but there is there's all kinds of toques and t-shirts and hoodies and on there and you any and any sort of extra money from that goes straight to the team and getting guys like John and, and the rest of the team to, to Beijing and hopefully to glory. Um, and yeah, of course, Toyota recently on board and uh, we're going to let John go and pick up his Tacoma and go yep. have a great rest of the day. So thank you so much for joining us, John. It's been incredible. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, I know that it's uh, pretty late in Europe for you and yeah, hopefully we get to shred one day. That'd be cool. Oh, mate, that'd be great. And also, don't forget to tune in when John. John's going to be on the other side soon, and he'll be doing the interview. So you can tune into the other Fear of the Flat Planets coming up soon on Canada Snowboard. So thank you very much, John. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, we'll see you next time.